Hello everybody and welcome to the webinar. This webinar is an introduction to International Public Sector Accounting Standards, IPSAS. Uh, welcome to everybody from uh, around the globe. We've got people from Malta, Abu Dhabi and Ljubljana. So welcome everybody. First of all, we'll do some introductions. So my name is Julia Cook. I'm um, a principal trainer with SIPFA's Education and Training Centre. I teach mainly on the professional qualification for SIPFA, but I also am involved in a number of international projects. And this is my colleague Kim, who will introduce herself. Hello, good morning everyone. I'm Kim Wood. Uh, I'm a senior trainer at uh, SIPFA. I teach professional um, qualifications but I've also done a lot of trainings in the past few years on IPSAS, so IPSA training and on IPSA implementations in various countries all over the world. So I'll talk to you later. Thanks Kim. Thank you. I am actually going to turn the webcam off for the duration of the webinar, but you will still be able to see our slides. So this webinar, it is delivered through Citrix and it will run for approximately one hour. There will be a chance at the end for um, questions, which we will answer as many questions as we can. If we don't answer any questions during the session, then we will come back to you after the session uh, through email. What are we going to be covering today? So in this webinar, we're going to give a brief overview of the IPSAS framework. We're going to talk about how IPSAS will help to improve financial reporting in the public sector. We're then going to talk about SIPFA's qualifications in IPSAS, the certificate and the diploma. And then we're going to give you a practical demonstration of the SIPFA IPSAS qualifications. And then at the end of the session, as I've said, there will be a question and answer session. So I'm going to hand over to Kim now, who's going to give you an overview of the IPSAS framework. Hello everybody again. We are now going to have a look at the IPSA framework. Right, I'm going to look at, first of all, the International Public Sector Accounting Standard Board. Uh, IPSA B. IPSA B is the international independent board that developed IPSAS. They developed IPSAS, which is today's topic, and uh, you can see on my box there the IPSA that has been developed by IPSA B will give us a very high quality public sector financial reporting standards, which IPSA B hopes eventually most public sectors would apply. The IPSA B, IPSA Board's operations are facilitated by the International Federation of Accountants, IFAC. I am sure most of you have heard of IFAC. IFAC is the Global Organization for the Accountancy Profession. It aims to strengthen the accountancy professions and contribute to the development of strong international economies, which is extremely important, um, or becoming more important nowadays. Now, as at 31st of January 2017, we now have 40 accrues uh, IPSA standards uh, published, and we also have one cash basis uh, standard. We will briefly touch on the difference between accrues standards and cash basis standards um, in a few minutes. As the world is evolving and the government uh, PFM become more complex, IPSA B obviously cannot stand still. So they will be continuously developing accounting standards, guidance for the public sector specific financial uh, public sector uh, standards. We have 
seen just now, there are 40 accrues standards and the cash basis standards. At the moment, there are quite a few projects currently ongoing. One of the important standards which are being developed now is called non-exchange expenses uh, standards. Of course, many of us here today would have heard of IPSA 23, which cover non-exchange transactions, and that deals with revenue only. IPSA B is now looking at the non-exchange uh, expenses. The other standards, IPSA, which are being developed now, are infrastructure standards, infrastructure assets like highway assets and so on, heritage assets, and of course, leases. Because IFRS 16 has been published, so these are some of the standards that has been developing at the moment. Now, before I look at the framework in a bit more detail, I'm going to do a poll now. I'm going to launch a quick poll to see how many participants here have already have used IPSA. If you can just answer the poll, I will share, or we can share the poll result. So as we can see from the results, 29% of you here have answered yes, 50% not yet, you haven't uh, used IPSA yet, so no, and 21% are in the process of implementing IPSA. Nobody has voted cash basis, that's quite uh, interesting. So what I would now do is based on the information I collected just now, I'm going to go through some key areas with you about IPSA. Hopefully I can bring this result into our conversations. Now I have spoken some minutes on IPSA uh, and IPSA development. Some of you here may wonder what is IPSA? IPSA stands for International Public Sector Accounting Standards and as you can see from the slides, they are based on IFRS, formerly known as IAS. So IPSA Board adapts IFRS to a public sector context when appropriate. In undertaking that process, IPSA Board attempts wherever possible to maintain the accounting treatments and original tax of the IFRS unless there is a significant public sector issue which warrants a departure. I mentioned in my introduction that I have uh, involved in IPSA implementation in various countries and I have also seen uh, various countries I did my training in has their own uh, IPSA because although they use applied IPSA which dev was developed by the IPSA board but to meet their own country's requirements. What I would do now is to share with you the roadmap for developing IPSA. Now you can see from this diagram here, very clear, we have a few uh, steps we need to go through, in other words, IPSA board will go through. First of all, I mentioned just now, IPSA developed from or based on the IFRS. So IPSA B will first of all look at um, the IFRS and ask the first questions. Are there public sector issues that warrant departure? If the answer is no, for example, IS8 on uh, accounting policies, changes in econ um, accounting estimates and errors. If IPSA board feel that there is no requirement to issue a separate uh, IPSA, then they will just change the style and terminology used in IS8 so that it can be applied to a public sector setting. If the answer to the first question is yes, then IPSA board 
will ask another question. Should a separate public sector uh, project be initiated? Now, if the answer is no, for example, um, IPSA 5 is based on IS 23. If the answer is no, again, IPSA board would then modify IS 23, change the wording so that they are appropriate to the public uh, sector setting. If the answer is yes, in other words, a separate public sector project should be initiated, then IPSA board will set up the project. A good example, some of you might have come across IPSA 23, non-exchange transactions. Non-exchange transaction is not relevant in the private sector. So a separate project will then be set up. Another example will be uh, IPSA 21, in payment of non-cash generating assets. They will be IFRS, IAS, which are not relevant to the public sector. For example, IS23, earnings per share, or IS12, income tax. So they are not relevant to the public sector, and therefore there would not be any equivalent IPSA. I'm going to now give you three examples. The difference between IPSA and IFRS, how do they differ? So three examples here for you. There are lots of uh, different examples, but I think personally these three are quite important. The first one is IPSA 24. IPSA 24 is presentation of budget information in financial uh, statements. There is no equivalent IFRS. IPSA 24 requires a public sector entity to present the comparison between budgeted amounts and the actual amounts as long as the entity makes public its approved budget. Also, additional disclosure uh, required if there are any um, differences, significant differences between um, the actual figure and the budgeted figure. Now, in showing such a um, comparisons and making the required disclosure, the public entity can demonstrate how well it manages public funds and produce or provide services for which it is publicly accountable. So there's no uh, equivalent, equivalent IFRS. The second quite uh, interesting difference is IPSA 17 PPE. Now IPSA 17 uses the concept of service potential in the defi definition of public sector entities assets liabilities, income and expenses, and is an indicator of an asset's capacity to provide goods and services to the public in accordance with the entity's mandate. On the other hand, private sector applies economic benefits. Therefore, public sector may recognize assets, liabilities, income and expenses from debt of a private company. The third comparison is IPSA 21. Now following from IPSA 17, uh, the concept of service potential, so IPSA recognized that a major part of the public sector's assets may actually be non-cash generating, IPSA 21 was published. This give us, this IPSA give us guidance on how to impay uh, such assets, non-cash generating assets. Now the convergence between IPSA and IFRS continues. However, it is worth noting that there will always be differences between the two as IPSA 
cater not only to um, general purpose financial statements, but also to the public's need for information, the public entity's service performance and stewardship. On the other hand, IFRS is for private sector only. Right, we did a poll just now which shows us how many uh, countries or how many of you here has been um, using um, various basis of accounting. This is the various basis of accounting. Um, Cash-based uh, accounting, um, no one has voted yes just now for this uh, cash base. So cash base is the straightforward um, measure cash flow at the time cash flow actually took place. In other words, only actual receipts and payments will be recorded. This will be useful for um, countries who hasn't got um, any proper accounting systems yet. So this will be a good starting point. Now, the next step up will be modified cash basis. Modified cash basis means uh, we are using cash base um, IPSA, but we allow a short period of time after the year end for settling liabilities of the year just ended and we will treat this expenditure as occurring in the year just ended. So supposing our year end is 31st of March, we will we'll wait a while, let's say to um, April, end of April. So any payments we make in April will be treated as um, income or expenditures for the year ended 31st of March. For a cruise basis, IPSA, this will be obviously the optimum aim of all the countries, uh, government sectors. Um, it will record expenditure and revenues when they um, become due, but it also records assets and liabilities and is associated with the production of balance sheets. So government sectors, public services, not only will see how much they have spent, but also how much expenditure which they have incurred but not yet spent, not yet paid. This is quite uh, important because it gives us the full pictures. This will be useful for uh, planning purposes. And also, it, if we have recorded assets in the balance sheet, we will also have to prepare depreciation charge. Now, the final um, basis of accounting I want to talk about is modified accrues basis. This is similar to the full accrues basis, but it is simpler because it does not involve the capitalization of fixed assets nor the depreciation of uh, fixed assets. So, we have um, talked about so far the IPSA framework. I've given you the process of how um, IPSA is developed, the current work in progress projects, uh, the different basis of accounting. Now, those of you who have already implemented uh, IPSA, maybe full accrues uh, IPSA, hopefully you would agree why do we implement uh, IPSA. So here are some of the suggestions we put forward to you. Number one, if we apply IPSA, remember this is a public sector specific accounting standard, it will provide a, a more comprehensive and accurate view of a government's financial positions. Now, they can also improve the quality, consistency and transparency of public sector financial reporting, resulting in more or better uh, public sector decision makings. This makes government more accountable for their citizens 
because all the income and expenditure will be recorded, relevant assets and liabilities will be recorded. This includes grant money they have received, they will be recorded and it will show clearly where they spend those grant money. For example, the failure of governments to manage their finances could have dramatic consequences such as the impairment of democracy, social unrest as we have seen in some countries recently and the failure of government to meet their commitments today and the future. Implementation of IPSA obviously is very important for most uh, nations. Um, the optimum would be to get to the accrues. Now before I hand you over to um, Julia, I would just like to share the, my final slides with you. As um, we have um, discussed about the advantages of implementing IPSA and the PFM, public financial management issues, um, some countries encounter since the um, sovereign debt issues surface, you can see that IPSA are very much at the forefront of the public sector accounting arena and here at SIFA we have the expertise and knowledge to support you in your IPSA requirements. If my uh, discussion with you are not uh, clear or too brief, there are a few um, articles which will help you alone as well. The first article you might want to uh, look at is Global Standard Setting um, Journal. This is written by um, the chairman of IPSA board and you can find this article in Public Finance International. Uh, do subscribe to it because you get the um, um, publications um, direct to your inbox. The other article which might be uh, of interest to you is another article um, you can find in the Public Finance International. This is about IPSA 40 which was published on the 31st of March this year. So that might be of interest uh, to you. And Ian here is the chair of IPSA, IPSA board. Remember I mentioned he wrote this article. Um, he is also on the board of SIDFA. So I hope I've given you enough information or an overview of IPSA. Now I'm going to hand over to you, to Julia, who will talk to you about the SIDFA qualifications. Thank you. Hello again, so this is Julia. I'm going to tell you a little bit about SIPFA's qualifications in IPSA. So SIPFA offer two qualifications in IPSA, the certificate and the diploma. Let's talk about the CERT IPSA first. So the SIPFA certificate in IPSA, affectionately called CERT IPSA, this provides trainees with a basic foundation knowledge of the core published standards and successful completion of this course will demonstrate knowledge of the basic technical content of IPSAS and the ability to explain how certain events and transactions to public service organisations should be treated. So it covers a selection of um, IPSAS at a basic level. So this qualification would be good if you're new to IPSAS or if you've got a little bit of experience but need to refresh your knowledge. The DIP IPSAS, the diploma, this goes into far more detail and this is designed to provide trainees with a comprehensive knowledge of the published standards and guidance on applying the accounting requirements of the standards. So the diploma goes into uh, more detailed, um, more detail on um, on the IPSAS that are covered in the certificate and it also adds to those IPSAS and covers a few more. Now let me ask you a question and I'm going to put a poll on the screen. 
So maybe you're already aware of CIPFAS qualifications. So let me ask you, is anyone currently studying for one of these qualifications? So maybe you can answer the poll and let's see if anybody is already aware or has indeed already started studying for one of these. Thank you. So most people have voted now and you can see the results now. So uh, just a few of you have actually uh, started studying for these for the, one of these qualifications. Uh, most of you haven't, but it's good to see that uh, lots of you would like to in the future. So I'll give you a bit more information about these qualifications. So let me just stay with um, the CERT IPSAS to start with. So just um, a little bit more detail. So the CERT IPSAS, the objectives of this course, it basically gives you an introduction to IPSAS accruals accounting. So it covers a number of the accruals based standards. Um, it gives you an introduction to the cash flow statement and it gives you an introduction to financial reporting under the cash basis of accounting. So there is one of the units in this qualification which does look at the cash basis of accounting. It also gives you an introduction to the financial reporting context for public sector entities. So you'll notice that all the objectives of the CERT IPSAS um, are introductory. So they give you a flavour of a number of IPSAS and it's a starting point if you're new to IPSAS. The diploma, on the other hand, goes into far more detail. So it builds on the certificate. So it revisits some of the IPSAS covered in the certificate, but it goes into them in far more detail. So the objectives of the DIP IPSAS are to understand the role and purpose of IPSAS, to scope and plan IPSAS adoption and migration strategies. So if you are converting to um, IPSAS, then this qualification would be very useful. It also, uh, one of the objectives is to manage the implementation throughout the financial functions in a structured way. So it takes you through each of the IPSASs in turn, uh, so you can learn about it and think about how to implement it. It ensures finance and accounts teams and key stakeholders are fully prepared. So you have the knowledge, the technical knowledge um, to understand IPSAS and it helps you to effectively achieve IPSAS compliance. So just summing up the benefits of both the qualifications, so CERT being an introductory uh, qualification and diploma being far more detailed, but they would both give you leverage to promote specialist expertise in this technically demanding area. And as Kim said earlier, it is constantly changing as new IPSASs are being developed and old IPSAS are being updated. It would also allow you to achieve formal recognition, recognition from SIPFA, uh, being the leading body for global public financial management. And from a financial reporting point of view, it will improve the quality and transparency of your financial reporting. And indeed, Kim did outline the benefits of that earlier. So let me tell you a little bit about the actual qualifications, the learning and the assessment. I am actually going to give you a, a live demonstration of the learning materials in a minute. Um, but basically, for each of the qualifications, the CERT and the DIP, um, there's a series of online modules and interactive workbooks, um, including practical examples and self-test questions. So it's all online. You can access it through your PC or your tablet, and everything is there for you, including the tests. And that's for both the certificate and the diploma. The certificate... There's no formal examination. It basically supports your learning on the job. At the end of the course, a certificate of completion is available. So basically, you work through the modules, um, you do the self-test questions, but there's no formal exam. But you will have a certificate at the end. Now, with the diploma, this goes further 
and it pre prepares trainees for an end of course online assessment. So once you've worked through the materials and done the, the module tests, then there's an exam at the end of it. To pass the exam, you must achieve a minimum of 60%. And if you pass, you will receive the SIPFA Diploma in IPSAS qualification. You are allowed to attempt the examination up to four times during the 12-month registration period. So there's a little bit of flexibility just in case you don't pass first time. I'm now going to show you um, a practical demonstration of the SIPFA IPSAS qualifications. Now this slide shows the first screen you would see once you've purchased the qualification and you log in. So I, if you just bear with me one moment, I'm just going to switch screens to get into the live system. This is the first screen that you would see once you've purchased the qualification. My screen shows both the certificate and the diploma. Now the actual structure of the materials is very similar, so I'm actually going to use the diploma to demonstrate. So I would click on go to course, and this is the screen that you just saw on the slide. So this is the, the sort of opening screen of your materials. There's a little bit of sort of introductory documents which you can read before you start the qualification. So introduction to diploma in international public sector accounting standards. This gives an outline of the course and the setup of this is very similar for the certificate. There's also a table of contents. I'm just going to click on that and show you. And notice as well on the right hand side of the screen, you can see my mouse moving around. Um, you can see the names of the workbooks and, and the contents. So I'm just going to click on the table of contents so you can get a feel for what it looks like and it brings up the contents in more detail. So for each workbook and for the diploma there are 10 workbooks. You can see a breakdown of each of the sections. Okay. Um, and you can click on any of these, say you, need, you needed to refresh yourself uh, while you're studying on, um, for example, accruals-based statements. You could just click on any of those um, sections. Now what I'm going to do is just show you one of the workbooks. So you can also use the left-hand menu. So let's click on this one, Workbook for Accounting for Impairments. Kim talked earlier about impairments and how it differs in public services from private sector due to the existence of non-cash generating assets. So workbook four, this is what the materials actually look like. So you can do it all on a PC or a tablet and you just basically use the arrows to click through the pages. So it, it uh, links into the syllabus, the learning objectives and to other to other workbooks in the um, qualification and then it starts giving you the technical theory of accounting for impairments um, in accordance with the relevant IPSAS. So you would study the materials and make sure you understand it and as you work through the materials there are key definitions which are highlighted so these would be particularly important for passing the exam, the diploma exam. And also there are examples. So this is um, this one, exercise 4.1, examples of cash generating and non-cash generating assets. And you can actually type in your answers as you're going along. So can you think of cash generating assets? Well, maybe you could chat some into the chat box while I'm actually completing the example. Obviously I've not put real answers in here, I'm just using it as a test. So you would type in some examples of your cash generating and non-cash generating assets and then to test if you've answered it correctly you can look at this hint and it gives you some ideas. So for example cash generating a hospital with fee paying patients non-cash generating a hospital funded through 
public sector resources. So you can check your answers as you're going along. You could then continue studying. I'm just going to flick through the pages very quickly. So it goes through the technical theory of the standard and, and with illustrations and examples as you're going along. And then as you get towards the end of the workbook, um, it sums up each of the standards that are covered in that workbook and then on the final page it gives a summary. There's usually an exercise at the end of each workbook which is a bigger exercise. So this one, for example, gives you a trial balance and a number of notes. This is quite a big question, so you will have had to study the unit in detail before you can answer this. And then it asks you to prepare some statements. And again, you get the answer in the hint. And there are some more examples. Now, if I just go back to the main menu, so I'm just you can see that on the left of the screen. So once you've completed the workbook and you've done all the exercises, you're then ready to sit um, a self-assessment question test. So for each of the workbooks, there will be one of these. So I'm just going to click on that now. And this shows you, I'm going to, I did this earlier on, so I'm just going to re-attempt it. So you'd click on the quiz, and it's a multiple choice um, exact, uh, test and a number of questions where you can just click on the answers. I'm just going to randomly click for the moment just to show you how it works. So these may not be correct. And then once you've finished the test, you can submit and finish, or you can go back and resubmit your answers. So I'm going to submit all and finish. Oh dear. I failed to reach the pass mark. Well, I only did it quickly and randomly. But what, if you'd studied the unit, then obviously you would do much better. But this gives you um, an idea of how you've performed. And you can go back and redo the test as you need to. So for each um, workbook, there is a, um, a self-assessment. And you can see that in the contents uh, menu here. Now, at various points during the course, in the diploma module, there are also progress tests. You don't get progress tests in the certificate qualification. You just get the self-assessment tests. The progress tests are preparing you for the real exam. So there's a progress test after workbook four, and there's one after workbook seven, and one after workbook 10. So once you've done all the self-assessment questions and the progress tests, you're ready um, to sit the exam. And that will be sat online, and, um, and you will have four attempts at that, and 60% pass rate, 50% pass mark, sorry. OK, now if you do want a PDF of the materials, that's also um, available. So you can see here, there's a PDF format, so you could download that and print it if you wanted to. Okay, so that was just a quick run through the, um, the materials. And that actually now brings us to the end of the presentation. So I'm going to go back into my slides. And at this point, we'd like to ask you if you have any questions. So hopefully the webinar has given you an introduction to IPSAS, the general framework, and um, given you an idea of the SIPFA qualifications, both the certificate and the diploma. So I will just pause a while and allow you to type your questions into the question box, and Kim and I will do our best to answer them. OK, we can see your questions coming in, so Kim and I will start answering them. Um, one question is, how long do the courses on average take to complete? Well, it does depend on your sort of personal method of studying, but the certificate course would probably take around 35 to 40 hours to complete. Yes, um, so a couple of hours on each workbook to 
to study the materials and to complete the self-assessment tests. The diploma, we would expect it to take a bit longer because you are preparing for an exam, so probably more like 60 to 70 hours of studying. But, you know, it does depend on your personal sort of study methods. Is it possible to start the CERT at any time or, is, or are there fixed start dates? No, you can start it at any time. So once you actually purchase the product, that's when you get access to the materials that I was just showing you. And um, you can then start working, working through them. For the diploma, there's a 12-month period in which you have to study and complete the exam. And if you don't pass the exam in four attempts within that 12 months, then you would have to re-register and basically redo the course. Uh, we also have questions here. Um, can we study the diploma um, IPSA without completing the certificate IPSA? The answer is yes. So you can see the CIPFA qualification is very flexible. If you feel you already have the basic knowledge, then you can go straight into the diploma IPSA. Yes. Um, specifically, what IPSAS are covered in the CERT IPSAS? Um, the CERT IPSA covered most of the standards which you will cover in the diploma. The difference is the depth of the, the, the uh, standard, yeah, how much we're covering. Yeah, so for example, property, plant and equipment is covered in the CERT at a basic level, but then it's built upon in the diploma level. Um, impairment is covered in the yes. CERT. So most of the uh, sort of, if I can say, the more popular standards in the, the certificate. Basic standards, the basic standards, you need to know, because bearing in mind what uh, Julie um, mentioned in her um, illustrations, that the diploma IPSA built on the certificate IPSA, so we have to start you somewhere. That's why the certificate uh, uh, standard uh, qualification is at an introductory uh, level. Yes, and if you go on to the SIPFA website, um, which we're going to give you details at the end, you can actually see a list of all the IPSAs that are covered in both of the qualifications. Anyone can register and do the uh, either the CERT or the DIP. You don't have to be um, sit for qualified or you, you don't actually need any pre-qualifications. I mean, some background in bookkeeping would be advantageous, um, but anyone can actually register and do the qualifications. There aren't any other resources apart from the online um, materials. So there aren't any online lectures, but if you're having difficulty, you can come through to SIPFA, um, you know, and raise any technical queries that you have. Um, yes, we've just had a question about uh, this presentation today. It is being recorded and um, it will be available after the session to um, all attendees. So yes, you can listen again if you wish. Okay, um, we've got a question about the someone who's completed the CERT IPSAS in the past. So SIPFA have um, updated their materials and developed the diploma. Um, so we're having a, a question here about whether the certificate is converted to a diploma. Um, I do have to say I'm not quite sure on the answer to that, so I will find out, Hassan, and come back to you if that's okay. I'm just reading through the questions. So, yeah, there are, um, we've got a question or comment here really about Japan. Um, really, that's what Kim was saying about the um, modified accruals process. So there will be country-specific differences 
and uh, indeed some countries will modify IPSAS to be implemented in their own countries. Yes, uh, IPSA 23 non-exchange transactions actually cover and give us quite a lot of guiding notes on uh, income. This is taxation income, whether it's income tax, corporation tax, or like in the United Kingdom, we have national insurance. Um, I think this is a project they are looking into because they are now looking um, to develop a standard on non-exchange uh, expenditures. Um, <clears throat> The, this question actually come from, I think, someone from uh, Japan, yes, about this uh, income um, tax, because um, in Japan, their income tax is treated as, or their tax income is treated as uh, investment income. My personal view is most countries will not treat um, or the government would not treat the tax collected as investment income. This will be the income. So probably is a different interpretations for this standard. We're almost at the end of the session now, so just a, a few more questions. Um, we're getting a few questions about the cost of the products. Um, I think what we'll do with that is um, give you the information after the session or indeed you could go onto the SIPFA website to check out uh, the actual prices of the product but we will make that available after the session and um, the other the final question here um, can you study for diploma without completing certificate? Yes, you can. So indeed, if you do have some um, experience already of IPSAS and you feel comfortable going straight into the diploma, then yes is the answer to that question. Um, yes, an email will be sent to everyone who has um, joined the webinar today. So we'll answer those questions that we haven't answered today and give you further details. So just to finish the webinar today, many thanks for listening. This slide shows us how you can contact us at SIPFA, www.sipfa.org. And if you want to email us directly, ipsas at sipfa.org. Thank you very much for listening today and bye-bye. And bye-bye from me, Kim. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening.